Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we, Lord, we want to come before you humbly, bowing our hearts, asking you to stir those hearts, our souls, our minds, to your truth, uh, through your spirit, that we might glorify you and your son, because indeed you are worthy, and so is your spirit, and so is your son. And you deserve our best. Uh, and that best is, is manifested first on the inside, and then it comes through us as we live a crucified life. And we daily surrender ourselves anew, not, not for new salvation, but just reminded that it is Christ who bled and died for us, who rose again for us. And in light of that, that we would willingly, out of hearts of gratitude, yield to his leadership in our life so that we could be vessels fit for the master's use, that we would be ambassadors that you would be proud of as you send us out into the marketplace in our neighborhoods and our homes all week long. So, Father, give us a spiritual appetite. Increase in us who have one a greater one. And then, Father, may we leave here with greater wisdom, wisdom to rightly handle the word of truth in our personal lives and those around us. We pray this in the name that is above all names, that of the Lord Jesus Christ, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue is going to confess. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved but the name of Jesus. It is indeed the sweetest name I know. We pray this in his blessed name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5 as we continue to look at our, uh, the Beatitudes as Jesus has started the Sermon on the Mount, as it's uh, called by most theologians. Uh, just as a bit of a reminder as we get back to it, that remember chapter 5 begins with when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. The them is first the disciples, and then also the crowd that had gathered. They weren't all disciples that day. And I would dare uh, suggest that probably any crowd that's ever been brought together in his name, there are going to be those that uh, are not actually his. Um, but I just want to, the, the why I want to uh, remember that truth is that um, he's teaching his disciples and in chapters 5, 6, and 7, uh, he is teaching not how to go to heaven, not how to be saved, not how to be born again, but he's teaching those that already are his followers how they should live their lives here on earth for his glory and his cause. Remember, I've told you many times, Daniel Aiken said this, the Sermon on the Mount does not teach men and women how to live to get into the kingdom. That is so critical when you study this sermon that Jesus preached. We are not going to do all of this in order to somehow approve ourselves before God. We can never do that. We are sinners saved by grace. You will never make yourself approved by God because of any effort on your part. We are approved by, by God for one reason and one reason only, and that is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are in a position of righteousness, of sanctification, because of the work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection on the third day. It is just critical that you remember that. Now, because we have been saved by Christ, we should remember what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5 when he said that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died on their behalf. And so we, we are going to try to live out the teachings of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in a way uh, to make mu much of Christ and 
to show the world a different way to live than the life they're currently living. So Achan says, the Sermon on the Mount does not teach men and women how to live to get into the kingdom, but how men and women in the kingdom sh should live. You got that? It's not how to get in. You're in through faith in Christ and no other way. You're not in because you believe in God. You're not in because you give money to the church. You're not in because you hold a position in the church. I dare say there'll probably be guys standing in the pulpit when Jesus comes back that are not gonna raise up to meet him in the air. We are saved for, by one name, and that's Jesus Christ. And it's not his name, but his person. He came to this earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, rose again on the third day, has ascended back to heaven, and one day he's coming to collect his bride, the church. So we're not going to attempt to live this. By the way, you can't live this in your own strength. You'll only live this through the Holy Spirit's leadership in your life as we live crucified lives. So Aiken's right. Uh, we, this, the Sermon on the Mount does not teach men and women how to live to get into the kingdom, but how men and women in the kingdom should live. We are not accepted by God because of anything we do. We are accepted by God completely and totally because of perfect Savior who has died a bloody death in our place and who has risen again in victory and we all say that are saved, amen and amen. So today we're gonna look at Matthew 5 and verse 9, but I'm just gonna read uh, 5, 1 through 9 just to sort of keep us in, uh, uh, get us back in the swing of things. So it starts this way, Jesus, verse 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and began to teach them saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And now, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Each pronouncement has a promise connected to it. The one connected to blessed are the peacemakers is that we shall be called sons of God. What a title to have and to be called that. Amen? And so we're going to look at peacemakers, and we're going to define it. We're going to look at it, what it is, what it isn't. Uh, I was looking this week. Uh, there are approximately 400 direct references to peace in the Bible. You know, if the Bible says it once, it's significant. If it says in some way or another about peace 400 times, it's a pretty important subject, don't you think? It's interesting. I read MacArthur this week said a really interesting. He said, the Bible opens with peace in the garden and ends with peace in eternity. It opens with peace in the garden and all the hell that's between the garden and the end it's going to end in peace. Amen. The lion will lay down with the lamb, praise God. And so we started in peace and we're going to end in peace. Those that uh, God has called into his family through faith in Christ. And so, but right now you say, well, brother, that might be true. We might have started in peace and we might end in peace, but it's all hell now. Right? I mean, it is crazy what's going on. The vitriol and the hatred that people have for one another. And unfortunately, I think the church is getting sucked into that through politics. And, and, uh, and by the way, I'm not anti-politics. I'm not anti-politicians. I wish they all were born again, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I wish they would go to God, uh, not, not stick their finger in the air to see which way the wind's blowing, but to uh, get on their knees before God and ask God what He would want for our nation uh, that he is blessed so mightily through time. But there is vitriol in all kinds of area uh, in our country. And my fear is, is that the church unknowingly has been sucked into that vitriol. I mean, we put out the hateful memes and the slams against this and that. And, and, and then I hear brothers say, yeah, brother, we're called to contend for the faith. And, and, and that's, a tr that's true, it's biblical. We're called, but how we contend for the faith matters. You're never leading anyone to Christ through your own self-righteousness. You're not gonna lead people to Christ by just slamming them. You know, it's interesting, when Jesus walked this earth, if we're supposed to be WWJD, what would Jesus do? 
if you study his life, and by the way, if you've never read the four gospels consecutively, please do that. Begin today, a chapter a day. Start in Matthew, end in John. Read the life of Christ. Read his life. Listen to his direct teaching, how he handled people. I mean, Sally, in today's culture, in America, we would slam a traitor tax collector. The church would. The church would get up in their soapbox and slam the hookers. The church would. And yet, when I study the life of Christ, I don't see him operating that way. He went into publicans and sinners' homes, Sally, and ate with them. He broke bread with them. The wick, and by the way, you don't hate sin near like Jesus does. He's God incarnate. He has the same hatred for sin that his father does. But when he walked this earth, he walked it in humility and love and grace and mercy. The only harsh words that Jesus had were for who? The religious, I'm fair, the religious. The religious people who didn't know him and by their religion and self-righteousness were keeping people from him. He had harsh words for them. He called them a brood of vipers, a whitewashed sepulcher full of dead men. I mean, you just read in late Matthew how he describes these religious phonies that had twisted up the nation of Israel with all of their do's and don'ts and legalism, and you got to do this and that and the other. And, and Jesus came and said, come to me, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. You know, my burden is light. It, it, all that stuff they're doing to you and saying you got to do, they're wrong. And they're keeping you from me. And we need to be careful in the church that we're not guilty of that. Do I say that we should wink at sin? Do you know me? No. But how I handle a person that's unsaved that comes into our congregation who's doing illegal things will be different than how I handle a person that, that professes Christ doing the same things. This person sits in darkness. They don't know any better. I will talk to them about their sin. But what I'm going to talk to them a lot about is the hope, mercy, and grace of Jesus Christ. This person over here who says, no, 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 I know Jesus, then stop sinning. Because you, in your sin, are being a roadblock to this person who needs Christ. Are you listening? Jesus now comes to this seventh beatitude, and he's going to rock their world. Remember, they've been sitting under pharisaical teaching and all their legalism and all that junk, and now he's going to say to his disciples, the them there that he's talking to directly are his disciples, and he's going to say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. My, how I want that title with my name. Adopted heir of Christ, son of God. Who do you think you are? Man, I'm nobody. I have that title because what the son of God did for me. Amen? No self-righteousness is here. You want to talk about, I know who you are. Well, great. <laughs> I don't try to hide it. I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace, and I'm working on progressively being sanctified uh, for the cause of Christ to make much of him, but I am an absolute work in progress. How about you? So let's define this word peacemaker. Peacemaker. You ready? One loving peace who's peaceable and strives to make peace between two parties that are at odds together. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, we need to understand, I don't even know where I got this, but I got it, and I would give credit, but I'm not sure where I got it. And last time I preached this was, not what, nine years ago, something like that, 10, 12, I don't know. Uh, when it was some of you marking your Bible, you'll tell me later, I'm sure. Uh, there are three kinds of 
people connected to this concept of peace. Three kinds that are connected to the concept of peace. Two of them are negative, one of them is positive. If you, if you, hey, by the way, if you like sitting back there during worship, but you ever want to come forward so you can sit and take notes and have your Bibles open, your drinks on the table, listen, the more of you that do it, if we fill up this up, we're going to make another row. It's just to make it easier for you to take notes and to have your Bible out and to, so if you want that, fill these tables up and then we will put another row in and do it that way because this should be a classroom, if you will learning. And if you're like me, I cannot write on my lap. I can't even eat. I, gotta, I take a bar stool out of our kitchen, use it as a dinner tray, set it in front of my chair. Milo sits at my feet because I'm sloppy. And, uh, and Trudy's over there cutting stuff, plate in one hand. I can't do that. I just throw it everywhere. So uh, if you're like me and you're a little bit clumsy like that, these tables would be good. And it'd be good for your kids if we put them back there. Hey, bring, bring a puzzle for your kids. We don't care. If they're going to be in here and they can listen with their ears, if they're doing something with their hands, uh, don't bring a 5,000-piece puzzle. <laughs> bring a little one that they can get done. Oh, pastor, don't move this all week. <laughs> so we just got the border done. The first group connected with this word peace are peace breakers, are peace breakers. Who are those? Those who go out of their way to break down relationships. They are combative over any and everything that they're involved in. You ever known someone like that? Don't call their name out and don't elbow your spouse because I'll see it and that'll be bad news. Peace breakers, they're cantankerous. Nothing's ever right. They fight over everything. Everything in their life is negative. They are literally enemies to peace with how they live. In Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul speaks of these kind of people. By the way, he's speaking about people in the church. Remember, we don't have two standards, but remember this. How we handle those in the church is different than how we handle people outside the church. And what I mean by that, I'm not even talking about all of you gathered here today. There are some in here that are lost. If you draw your last breath today, you're going to perish. I hate it, but it's going to be true. And today is the day of salvation, and I pray that you'll make that happen, or that the Spirit for you will make that happen. But then there's those in this building that are the church, the ecclesia, the called out of God. They're saved children of God. And that's who Jesus is preaching to, by the way. And when Paul writes what he writes in Romans 16, it's to those people who are professing a relationship with Christ. Here's what he says. You ready? Because we know it's got to be to those inside the church because those outside the church were called to, to reach out with the gospel. So he can't be speaking to them. Romans 16, 17, 18, here's what Paul says. You ready? Now I urge you, brethren, he's urging, like, it, it, listen to me, keep your eye, keep your eye, watch out for, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learn and turn away from them. Did you hear that? You think that's being practiced in the modern church? Not probably enough. Could you imagine, hey man, don't go out to AFM. Why? They'll kick you out. What they won't say is they're violating this. What they'll never say is they're peace breakers, right? Those who go out of their way to break relationships, to tear down people. Paul says, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teachings you have learned. So stop. There's a qualification that Paul puts on this, right? Who's he calling this? Those that are living lives contrary to the teaching of Scripture. Peace breakers violate Scripture and what they're doing. He says, listen, keep an eye on these people who cause dissension. I've... <laughs> I've he, when I first got saved, I heard stories of uh, women shooting each other over the color of carpet in a church. Well, you think that woman got cantankerous that day when she pulled out the pistol and shot the person? 
You think that's pretty much the life she had been living? <laughs> See, when we ignore the commands of Scripture, listen to me, it's to our own peril. It's to our own peril. It's to the peril of our church. It's the, to the peril of our witness out there. If you are calling yourself a Christian and you are tying yourself into AFM, how you represent yourself will reflect not only on God, but the rest of us. And that should matter. When my kids left the house, you know, Jillian quit giving me a moochie at sixth grade. No more moochies for dad. She's a junior high kid. I didn't get one on the cheek. And she said, you know, dad, don't embarrass me around my friends. Okay, I, I, I got great delight in doing that. But okay, so she didn't want me to embarrass her in front of her friends. But you know what, man? I'd tell my kids, I don't want you embarrassing me. That's a two-way street. You carry my name. What you do, whether you know it or not, is going to reflect back on me. Now, it'll be unfair if I'm teaching you all the right things and you choose to do the wrong things. But there's no question. They're going to look at Trudy and I and say, what on earth didn't you teach them? Well, wait a minute, friend. Everybody's got a sin nature and everybody's got free will to do what they're going to do about their sin nature. And we got to quit, we got to quit condemning parents for things kids are choosing to do. Now, if you're teaching the right thing and they do the wrong thing, you're off the hook with God. And so I'd tell them, listen, you represent me and Trudy. How you conduct yourself out there matters. And so I would say that to the church of Jesus Christ. Paul's saying this. He's saying, listen, keep an eye. Keep on the look. Now, we're not fruit inspectors, judgmental, self-righteous jerks. I'm, Pastor, I got the church covered. Don't worry about it. I've set myself up as the one. I'll give you a report each week as to who needs to get blasted. It's, you don't have that gift. But Paul is telling the church how we interact with each other matters, right? How we interact with each other matters. And he's saying, keep an eye out on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. And by the way, you can't know what they're violating if you don't first know what the truth is about that which they're violating, Right? Every week I have people talking to me and they'll say, man, you're never going to believe this, that, or that. And I say, man, here's what happens. I say that, I hope you remember this. When this book gets closed in your personal life, that in your home, you'll create the, whatever God you want. And the God you create will never, ever be mad at you about what you're doing wrong. Now, he'll be mad at everybody else, but not you. And once you create your fake God, then you, you're going to have to create what he's okay with. And so what you do is get around a bunch of other people who have created a fake God, and you come up with a whole bunch of fake stuff. Well, how do you know what they're saying is fake? There's only one way to know, Sally, and that's through the Word of God. So when I hear someone talking that way, the first thing I'll do lovingly is say, hey, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? And you know, almost always, they hang their head and say, Pastor, I'm not, no, I don't know that. Paul is saying to the church, listen to me. Keep an eye out on for those who cause division. That dissension and division according to the word that was taught. So, so you got to know the word to know whether what someone's doing is right or wrong, which brings us back to Hebrews 5. I won't go there. Uh, Hebrews 5, when it says, Strong meat belonging to them that by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. The senses there are not taste, smell, touch. It's spiritual senses. It's to know what is right and what is wrong. Hey, that what's coming out of that guy's mouth is wrong. I know it's wrong because Ephesians 2, 19 tells me it's wrong. So he says, listen to this. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learn and turn away from them. Turn away from them. Turn away from them. Turn away from them. For such men are slaves, and by the way, this can be women too. For such men, women are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. 
and by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. That's how cults are established. That's how you can fill up arenas in Houston. It, 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 because people don't know the truth. The church is absolutely starving for the truth. I'm talking about out there, y'all. You got you to gotta immerse yourself in God's word because your family's at stake. And I want to know that I'm, 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 I'm doing that which God can bless, not that which God's got to judge. Paul says, listen, listen, watch out for them. They're slaves, not of Christ like we are, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. The first time I was ever a deacon was at a church when I was uh, in, finishing up my undergraduate degree, Elkhorn, right, baby? Is that, no, was it Elkhorn? I don't know what it was. What's the name of that church? You remember? I'm sorry? No, I think it was Elkhorn. I, I don't know. Anyhow, I'm 62, is a church. And when they came to me and said, uh, hey, you know, they always put up all the men's names for deacons as a rotating thing. Some guys would go off. They had to get new ones. And the pastor came to me and he said, uh, listen, we, uh, the vote last week, you were voted in as deacon. I said, mm, don't want anything to do with it. Uh, I'm not worthy. Um, I'm a work in progress. I wasn't as developed as I felt like I needed to be in the word of God. And so I just kept saying no. And then finally he comes back to me and says, Jim, you were the only unanimous vote. You got to do it. You got to do it. So I did it. Then that pastor left and a pastor that had been the pastor wanted to come back and people begin to do what they do in churches when they're not slaves to Christ, but to their own appetites. They begin to try to recruit people to their side. And so a guy came up to me after church, pulled me aside. He ran a grocery store and he, hey, Jim, you're so awesome. You're, you know, I was getting a little puffed up. I'm like, well, maybe I'm better than I think I am. And then he hits me with, you know, what we need to do and all the warning bells he was doing what we just read about in Romans 16. By his smooth and flattering words, Sally, he was recruiting me. You understand what I'm saying? So when they cause divisions, they don't do it all the time by being a jerk. They will appeal to your fleshly nature. They might praise you. They might tell you how great you are. But the whole time they're doing it, it's to get their hooks in you. If you don't have a working knowledge of God's word, you'll be susceptible to that kind of dissension. Well, a person could be saved. Not, no, 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 you can be saved. Look at Hebrews 5. If you go back up a few verses, those people have become dull of hearing. They should have been teachers by now, but they were still needing the very elementary oracles of the of the Word of God. They were still on the milk of the Word, not the meat of the Word, but they were saved. You can be dull and saved. I'm not talking about your personality. <laughs> but you can... <laughs> Names are flashing through my mind. No, you can be dull. Baby, I'm sorry. It wasn't you, honey. Anyway, you, can be, you can be spiritually dull and saved, and so you're, you're, you're susceptible to what they say. Now, the second group is not please excuse me, not peace breakers. These are peace fakers. Peace fakers. What's a peace faker? These individuals go to any length to avoid conflict and confrontation. In doing this, they settle for a counterfeit peace that is based on avoiding whatever the, whatever the issue that needs to be resolved to bring true peace. Peace. Peace fakers mistake the absence of conflict for peace. While underneath the surface is a cauldron of anger, bitterness, resentment, frustration between the parties involved. These people just will compromise. They'll do whatever it takes. Is all they want is peace. Hey, we're supposed to be peacemakers. So I just, I just want to be at peace. Can we just be at peace? Can we just, can we just like, like get over this? And, and I don't want any trouble with you. I just, and, and to that, they're peace fakers. It's a counterfeit peace. It's not real because here it is. You ready? Genuine spiritual peace only comes through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ 
And when we go from being at enmity of God, at war with God, to being at peace with God, we'll look at that in a second, then and only then can there be genuine peace between two people. Only then can there be genuine peace. Peace fakers are the people in the church that say, no, 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 I just want peace no matter what. I, you know, like, I, I know, I know what they're doing, but hey, you know, let, let's, <laughs> I don't want to do the heavy lifting of having to wade through the difficulty of their errors. There are times in my ministry where I know I have to go to an individual because the truth demands it. And in my flesh, I don't want to go. I'm just weary. Sometimes I'm weary in the battle. And I don't want them to leave the church, and I don't want them to hate me. But what they're saying and doing is wrong. And as an under-shepherd... As the watchman, I have a responsibility to God to address this. And it, on the one level, it stinks. But if I'm really out for their good, and if I'm really a peacemaker, then I've got to sit that person down, show them the error in the word of God, hope the Holy Spirit beats me to the meeting, Pray that he's there before I get there. He's got their hearts prepared for what needs to be said so that it can be a peaceable meeting and repentance can take place and, and, uh, um, and we can move on down the path in agreement because the peace that we have now is be through the truth of God's word and we're both in alignment with what God's word says about how two people should be operating in their life. Peace fakers don't do that. They just simply say, you know... If we just ignore it, it'll go away. You ever felt that way with your kids, guys? I, none of you have battled with teenagers, right? <laughs> By the time my last two got through their teenage years, I knew for sure God wanted me to raise no more teenagers. <laughs> I mean... I, To have to, one more time, have that conversation. You know, the kind where when you leave, they, they think they hate you. The groundings, the discipline, because you're trying to get them to see what the truth is. They're professing believers. And so now they're bound by the truth. So you take your Bible and say, hey, this is where I stand. This is why I stand. This is why you need to do this. If you can't do this, I, I can remember even when they were young, I, I'd sit on the edge of their bed and say, do you want your daddy to be in sin against God? And their eyes would bug out. They'd say, no. I said, well, then I'm glad you said that because we're about to have a talk. <laughs> because I love you so much, I've got to risk the friendship of our relationship. You know what's crazy? There, every one of my kids probably hated me at one point or another. For sure. But now when I watch their adult lives, it's amazing how much actually got through. But I can't claim it. You know what I mean? I, hey man, see, I was right. I just say, God, thank you very much for helping that. Peace fakers want, they think being a peacemaker is the absence of conflict for peace. But that can't be true, right? That can't be true. Why do we know that? Because Jesus was the sinless son of God. And he said, and he said, um, mm -mm -mm, mm -mm -mm. Now, this is interesting. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the Son of God. Well, he was the Son of God. But in Matthew 10, verse 36, he's, 34, excuse me, he says, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. What? Blessed are the peacemakers, but you didn't come to bring peace? 
I mean, how, are those not contradictory? How, how can the, both those things be true? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. But Jesus says, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. And Jesus is saying, there is going to be conflict in the world. And if you're born again, that conflict could start in your home because you're going to live your life according to the word of God. If they're not there's conflict. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Being a peacemaker is based on truth, not the absence of conflict. Conflict happens. Conflict happens in marriages. Conflict happens in parent-child relationships. Conflicts happen in the workplace. Conflicts happen in the neighborhood. But because, listen, as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, to obey his commands so that we can be the house uh, uh, that we're called to be to withstand the storms of life that come our way. But it's got to be in truth. In truth. We don't look for fake peace. It's got to be the peace that God gives those who are in right relationship with his son who now carry that message of reconciliation that we can go from enmity with God to the sons of God if we're willing to surrender to his son Christ and experience the peace that passes all understanding. But it's through truth, Paul says in Ephesians 4.25. He says this, therefore laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each one of you with his neighbor for we're members of one another. Speak truth each one of you with his neighbor. Speak truth. Have you ever told a white lie? I hate that term. A lie's a lie's a lie. I'm, not even, I'm pretty sure it's probably even racist to say it's a white lie. Listen, lies are lies. There are no good lies. Have you ever told one because you didn't want to stir the pot? Have you ever let someone tell you a lie that you know you should tell them, no, no, that's wrong based on truth, but you let it go because you wanted peace with that person? That's not the peace that Jesus is talking about. The peace that Jesus is talking about is peace that is based on truth being obedient to God's word. Are you following me? You better understand that. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak true. Now, listen to me. I want to say this to you. Don't run out of here and just start putting everyone on blast because I'm going to speak truth today. Listen. When Jesus, in Matthew 18, I did a series on, for, for, I don't know when I did it recently, Matthew 18, on a series on forgiveness. Um, how we go about bringing truth into a, a brother or sister's life matters. Now remember, for the lost person, the truth they need is the gospel. You talk to them about all, no, 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 they need the gospel. They need to be resurrected. They need to be saved. But this is about conflict in the church. Here's what he says. Jesus says in verse uh, Matthew 18, verse uh, 15, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. So a brother's done something wrong. You know it's wrong because the word of God says it's wrong. You know that you can't ignore it because you're not being a good brother to that person by ignoring it. And you're now becoming a f peace faker. So you're going to go to that person, but you're not taking anyone with you. You're going to go individually. Why do we go individually? Because, listen, it is hard for any of us to hear our flaws. If you think it's easy for me, you're outside your mind. It is difficult to be told you've done something wrong. I was told I did something wrong a couple weeks ago after I preached a sermon, and that person was right. When I was talking about that we're the light of the world and we shouldn't hide under a bushel, and I intimated or flat out said, I don't know which, that... I, I, I somehow uh, would have led you all to believe homeschooling your children is bad. It is not bad. 
And the more wicked the marketplace gets, it's probably even better. We have to protect our, the little souls of our kids. Certainly when they're lost, I, I don't want you just dumping them out into a world of lostness while they're lost. So that person came to me and they were right. I was wrong. I, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't mean what I said, but it didn't clarify what I meant. So now before you, I'll, I'll tell you, I was wrong for saying that. I wasn't wrong for saying that we as saved people got to quit hiding our light under a bushel. We need to get involved in the world, right? And you can do that through Little League and, and all kinds of things, dance for side. There's a lot of ways that you can, with your kids, interact with the lost world. And so we're teaching our kids that we're going to uh, be evangelistic as a family. But, but to just turn them loose, I, I was wrong. And that person had the courage to say it to me. And they were right. And I was wrong. That person was a peacemaker. That person brought truth to me. The spirit inside me quickly agreed that that truth that person was speaking was accurate and good and right. I will not ever say that again, Lord willing. We're a family. I don't want to offend you unnecessarily with some stupid comment I make off the cuff. That wasn't in my notes. That's something. So we're a family. Let's work together. Let's strive together. Let's, let's walk in truth with one another. As Paul says, listen, lay aside falsehood and speak truth to one another. That's what we are. If, you, if you're going to be a peacemaker, it's going to, the peacemaking process is going to be centered in biblical truth. And it's for, the, it's for the good of those involved. Then finally, there's peace breakers and peace fakers. There's finally biblical peacemakers. Who is a peacemaker? Who is Jesus speaking about? Someone who has experienced the peace that God offers at the cross of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's at the foot of the cross that we have a change. We're a new creation in Christ. And we've gone from being at enmity with God, at war with God, to being at peace with God through his son, through our faith in his son. And now that we possess the peace of God, what are we to do with that peace? Look at Ephesians 2, 13 through 18. Paul writes this. He says, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. That's Judaizers, a whole bit there, which is performed in the flesh by human man. You know, Judaizers would follow Paul around and say, yes, it's Jesus, but it's circumcision too. And uh, he was, I, I don't want to say Paul was sarcastic, but he was saying, look, you Gentiles in the flesh uh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at the same, at that time separate from Jesus Christ. He's talking about their pre-salvation. And when they were separate from Christ, they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. That was the condition of the Gentiles. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus... You who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. How is Jesus our peace? He's our peace with God. It's how we've gone, uh, Tammy, from being at war with God. When we're born in our sin nature, we're, we're at enmity with God. We're at conflict with God. Remember what got Adam and Eve in the garden, right? When the serpent said, oh, you're not going to die. You're gonna, you, you'll get to be like God. And when he said that, that bugged Eve's ear, eyes out. And she thought, well, man, I don't want to have to serve. I'd rather be the one saying who, who has to do what. And so she ate. From that point forward, the human race has been in enmity with God, which is why God had to bypass the seed of Joseph, Mary's betrothed, because the seed of man is tainted with sin, the sin nature that we're created in. When we're born, how, how pretty baby is? They've been created, and they have a sin nature. Only Jesus was ever born a woman without one, and that's because God bypassed Joseph's seed, had the Holy Spirit hover over her and plant his son in her womb. Praise God. 
So, but now in Christ Jesus, verse 13, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. So not only we're at enmity with God, but Jews were at enmity with everybody else. That Gentiles is just a word for anyone that wasn't a Jew. And the Jews were self-righteous jerks who hated, who thought Gentiles. I mean, they weren't to touch. They had nothing to do with Gentiles, right? Nothing to do with Gentiles. And, and Jesus being our peace with God became our peace with each other. Now Gentiles and Jews were in the same family. So are black, red, yellow, and white. So Jesus is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in its ordinances, so that in himself, Christ... He might, Christ, might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. So now, Jew and Gentile that are born again, we've been recreated into this new creation. We're all the same in our relationship with Christ through the new birth that comes through faith in Christ at the cross. And that he might, verse 16, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. The peace starts at the cross. But once you experience the peace with God and you experience the peace of God, you should be striving to live at peace with those that follow God. Do you get that? For through him... Who's the him? For through Christ, we, have, we both, who? Jew and Gentile, have our access in one spirit to the Father. Humanity in its fallen state is called the enemy of God. We are in spiritual conflict with the Creator and need of God. And, and obviously, if we're in conflict with the Creator, we're in conflict with each other in this world. And it, it you know, Russia's invading Ukraine and Democrats and Republicans hate each other and this group wants to kill this group and this thing it's a, it's all a manifestation of of the sinful wicked flesh that we have but when we come to Christ when the spirit of god brings us to the foot of the cross and opens our spiritual eyes and we see that not only have we sinned against god we deserve the wrath of god but god so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that if we would place our faith, our belief in the person of Christ and his work on the cross and his resurrection on third day, that we would experience a new relationship with God, no longer at war with God. We are now called the sons of God. We, we are followers. We're the adopted heirs of Jesus Christ. We are the ambassadors of Christ. We now have peace with God. And nothing I do now will ever take away that positional peace that I have because I didn't got, get it because I was right. I don't keep it because I'm right. I got it and I keep it through Jesus Christ. Now, can I be at odds with God as his child? Absolutely. Absolutely. John MacArthur says that once we experience peace with God and we experience the peace of God, now we're called to take that peace to others. You see how that works? You can't take what you don't have. You can't take what you don't know. And you don't know it until you have it. And if you have it, you'll know it. And if you have it and you know it, you'll share it. MacArthur says this, Christians are not an elite corpse of a corpse, not corpse like dead body corpse, corpse like a group corpse, of those who have spiritually arrived and who look down on the rest of the world. Too much of that is in the church. It, it's so sad that we, we think we're contending for the faith, but it, we're, we're doing it with hostility in our hearts as if we too once weren't as wicked as anybody. We too were by nature children of wrath. We too experienced the grace, mercy, and love of God at the cross. We too got something we didn't deserve. And that's our message out there, that they too can have what we have. They can have peace with God. Uh, Why do I need peace with God? Because right now you're at enmity with God in the truth. And if you stay in that condition, when you die, you're going to perish and experience his wrath. 
Now you're going to show them in the Word of God. Don't do what I just did. Show them in the Word of God. And when I'm talking to someone individually, I show them in the Word of God. There's power in God's Word. It's the sword of the Spirit. Christians are not an elite corpse of those who have spiritually arrived and who look down on the rest of the world. They are a body of sinners cleansed by Jesus Christ and commissioned to carry his gospel out to the rest of the world. Now, that piece is about having peace with God. When we are being evangelistic, when we are sharing the gospel, we are talking about the peace of God so that they can be at peace with God. So when we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, now, is that just preachers? No, that's anyone, anyone. Anyone in the Greek means, anyone. If you're here today and you're in Christ, this is about you. He is a new creature. Hallelujah. I'm a new creature. The old dude's there, but I'm a new creature. The old things passed away. Uh, uh, the old things passed away. My desires, my, my, my fleshly hopes and, and lust and, and, and living for myself, all of that when I came to Christ is yesterday. And I am to forget what lies behind and press forward. I am to die to all that. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, remember that word behold, right? Look, new things have come. Well, some of those new things are the right standing with God, that we have a positional righteousness through Jesus Christ. Those are things that are for us individually. We're now in the family of God. But experiencing the peace of God, being reconciled back to God, now God has a mission for you and I. What is it? Verse 18. Now all these things are from God. New creation, new things, they're all from God. He's got a plan. He's now invited us into that plan because he saved us, redeemed us. The greatest witness God has of, of the reality of what Jesus Christ has done is the changed life of a human being. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself, reconciled two erring parties, two parties that were apart, two that didn't, weren't in agreement. Through Christ, he, 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 who God who reconciled himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, namely, here's the ministry we have. Namely, this is what we're to take out there, guys. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself uh, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So we take the word as we go out in the ministry of it and the word of it, because the word is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the word of God is the sword of the spirit. It can pierce the very hearts of man, all men, wicked men, and it can bring them into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And in a sense, we're taking the world by the hand. And we're bringing them to Jesus. Once they meet Jesus, he takes them to the Father. Our role is to take them by the hand. Is that what the church is doing these days? No. We condemn. We criticize. We mock. We put out memes. We put them on blast. That's not the ministry God gave you. He gave you one of reconciliation. Well, what, God? What do you mean reconciliation? Well, he answers it for you. He doesn't even leave it for your... He says, namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That word is that he's not going to count their trespasses against themselves, and they can be saved. When Karen changed her life, your daughter said, hmm, this girl is different. Let me go find out. And through that, she met Jesus. You're, you saw the change in your daughter, who you saw it in Karen, and you got saved. That's how it's supposed to work. Not because I preach that when you meet Christ, you live a changed life. And those around you who knew the before Christ, who now see the after Christ, yes, God's going to stir in some of them, not all of them. Hey, I need to check this out. Sally, your daughter. I need to go see what them crazy people out there are doing. Sat on the back row. 
and God snatched you up. You didn't even know. God brought you here. You didn't bring yourself here. You weren't spying on us. God said, I'm going to take what she thinks she's doing, and I'm going to bring her here. She's going to hear the gospel, and she's going to be saved. Then you got saved, and then you were here, and your life was changed, and TR, your husband, said, hey, man, Sally is not who she was. She is a different human being. I better go check that place out. <laughs> we trap them. <laughs> we lure them with our changed lives to the cross, and, <laughs> and TR came out, and I got to lead TR. No, no, you led TR. No, someone led me. I don't remember who led TR to Christ. And he was changed. And now he's in heaven waiting his resurrected body because your daughter was changed. Then you were changed. Then TR was changed. Karen was changed. Your daughter was changed. You were changed. And that is how it's supposed to work. Give him a hand clap. Who is seeing the change in your life? Are you a peacemaker taking the message of reconciliation through the word of reconciliation to the people in your life? Friend, I need to tell you some bad news so I can tell you some good news. When we're all born, and I'm going, to take them in, I'm going to take them in Scripture, the Bible says we're at enmity with God. Big word, all it means is this, that we're in conflict with the God who created us. Let me tell you why we're in conflict. Because back in the garden, Adam and Eve, the first two humans ever born, they were put in a perfect peace situation. They listened to the lies of the enemy, and they sinned, rebelled against God, and so they sinned, and God moved them out of the garden, tainted the seed of Adam. So all seed of all man is now tainted. We're all born with a sin nature. And so me, you, everyone. But the good news is this. God is not only just. He does have to deal with our sin, but he also wants to be the justifier. So he'll deal with your sin on the body of his son if you'll let him. Come on, man. Who is, who is saying to you, hey, you're really different. You're not who you once were. You're different. First Peter 3.15 says this, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. And now that we're elevating to top place, he's speaking to believers, sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. Not just Savior, he's Lord. You're elevating him top place. You're gonna change everything about your life to make sure it's in line with, his, with him and his commands. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, not condemning and blasting, not memeing them and sniping them, not gossiping about them, that we are going to sanctify Christ in our hearts. You and I, let's agree today, Christ is going to get supreme in our life. That means we're going to follow him. We cannot follow him if we don't even know what he's asking out of us, which is why this sermon that he's preaching today is so important, chapter 5, because this is how Jesus wants you and I to live our lives. And if we will say whatever changes need to be made, Maybe I was the funny dude at work, but I, I used, I'm funny because I, I tell coarse jokes. Well, the Bible says don't tell them. You going to stop? Ladies, gossip is sin. When you pick up that phone and call your friend and say, did you know blah, 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 you have now sinned before God. You have now harmed the wit your witness to that person. And they get off the phone and they tell someone because you know they're going to. You haven't helped the person you're talking about at all. All you've done is slander them. And everything you say might be true, but you haven't helped them. You're a cause breaker. You're a peace breaker. 
Are you listening? Be ready. Always be ready. <laughs> to everyone. Not, not everyone's going to ask, but to those who ask. To give an account for the hope that is in you. Man, that hope. That living hope. I've been birthed into the living hope through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. I've got living hope. I need to live that living hope every day. I want store clerks and grocery clerks to say, man, you are different. You are nice and kind and gracious. You, you are someone we look forward to seeing come into our store because we know that you're going to have a kind word for us. You are going to be patient with us. Me, patient. You're going to be patient with us. And when they say, why are you like that? Then I get to say, because I'm a new creation in Christ. He redeemed me from my old way of living. And the good news is, if you're willing to surrender your life to him, if you're willing to admit that you've sinned against God like all of us have, we all know we have, right? We all have, yeah. If you're willing to bring that honesty to the cross, God will redeem you through the blood of his son. All of that could take 30 seconds in the grocery line or have a tract and say, hey, I know you got a line. Boom, read this tonight. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us. <laughs> Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God because reconcile, reconciling is about taking two parties that are enmity with each other. You know, the basic definition of enmity is simply uh, this. Uh, we are children of wrath. We have failed God. We are at war with God. And all of us are prior to our salvation. And then there's a third and final characteristic that is true of a peacemaker. Uh, the second thing is you're going to look at me later and say, hey, man, I didn't get them. The first is they possess the peace of God. Secondly, they proclaim God's peace. And the third and final characteristic that is true of a peacemaker, not only has a peacemaker experienced true peace with God, not only does a peacemaker desire to have others experience with God, the third characteristic of a peacemaker is they strive for peace in all human relationships. Not a phony peace, not a fake peace that's, com that's built on compromise, but they strive to live peaceably among all people. Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That's in the church and outside there. As far as it's possible. Now, there are times... When they're going to go hard left, I'm not talking politically, they're going to go hard left. Can I be at peace with someone who's advocating abortion? Huh? You think that might create some conflict between us? Can I be at peace with someone who's cheating on their spouse? I can't be biblically at peace with people that are lost. But I'm going to be gracious towards them. But I can't be biblically at peace with them. Because that's based on truth. And the truth is we're all sinners come short of the glory of God. And until they know Christ and they've experienced the peace of God, I can never have peace with them. But I can live a peaceable life around them. I'm not going to critical, be critical. I'm not going to just uh, slam people um, in their lostness. <sighs> We're going to look at Matthew 5, 21 through 24 in a few weeks. This is something that's not being practiced in the church near like it should, and we'll look at it later, but let me say this before I close. Remember, the third thing is we strive for peace in all human relationships. Here's how you can know how serious Jesus is about this for his children. You ready? Not only Matthew 18 about the whole forgiveness angle, but notice this. He says this, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable in the court, to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Wow. Do we have some work to do? I've called people fools. 
Listen to what Jesus says. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother. Now, now there is a righteous anger. When Jesus drove him th- from the temple, right? He didn't sin. He had a righteous anger and he handled his righteous anger in the right way. Paul says in Ephesians 4, be angry and sin not. There is a righteous anger. Now, we can misuse the righteous anger into something that becomes our flesh and it becomes something sinful. But we ought to be angry about what God's angry about. But how do we handle that anger? How do we manifest that anger? He says, but I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, connector, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, worship. And there remember that your brother has something against you. That someone's come into your life and you've offended them and they've told you and you walked away in a huff. You're ticked off like, who are they? I can name you 10 things they've done. And we do all that to deflect from having to deal with what we've done wrong, right? So we deflect it that way. Here's what Jesus says for us to do. You ready? Leave your offering there. Remember, offering, act of worship. Leave your offering there before the altar and go. Go where, Jesus? First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. If you are at odds with a fellow believer, you know you are, they know you are, and you come here to worship every week, and you're not dealing with that conflict, we are failing the command of Jesus Christ. Yeah, but it's going to be complicated. I know. It's going to be hard. They might not even listen. Okay. That's where Romans 12, 18 comes in, if possible. It's not always possible, but if possible. It's not always possible. But if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Remember this as we close. Peacemaking only occurs when we speak truth in love. So that means we don't avoid difficult situations. We simply approach them in love for the edification of our fellow believer. Sometimes I'm the one that blows it. That person comes to me and says, hey, man, you offended me. What you said was wrong. And at first I was trying to defend myself because that's what we do, isn't it? Well, no, you just don't. No. I love this person so much. We've both been on each side of this little deal uh, on various things. But we have such a great relationship because we're not afraid to sit down with one another. She, what she did was Biblical. And now before the church, if any of you were out there ticked off about that, I apologize to you too. She was right. I was wrong. I'm not perfect. I'm not too big of a man to admit my failures. That's how we grow. That's how we learn. All of us, we're a family. My role is to preach. Yours is to do whatever God has called you to do, but we're a family. Okay, and the mouth can say to the ear, I don't need you, right? We're a family. We're one body. And so she could have, she, she could have gone home and stewed on this. Would she have been right to come back the next week and worship? Nope. Not without dealing with it. I could have been ticked off and said, I'm a lot better than she is. Oh, you want to do this tit for tat thing? You that's all flesh, man. It's all deflection. If Jesus wants to use you in my life, I have to be humble enough to listen for his glory. If Jesus wants to use me in your life, you need to be humble and receive it as long as it's biblical truth. Okay, not something off the top of each other's head. Can you show me what you're saying I've done in the word of God? No. Then friend, I don't know what to do with what you're saying. Now, in this case, this person said it. They were right, and immediately the Holy Spirit brought about 12 verses in my life. Let me tell you about the Holy Spirit. He's never brought a verse to my life that I didn't first put in my heart. He's never given me a verse that, oh, wow, I didn't even know that existed. 
You know what he uses in my life to change me? That which I put in my heart. And that's how he'll do it with you too. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons of God. What a title. I hope we understand peacemaking. I hope we do. The good thing about this is on tape, you can go over it a hundred times if you want. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I love you and I thank you. I thank you for the peace I have with you because of the work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. I'm thankful that I've experienced that peace, that I walk in that peace, and that you have given me the privilege as a child of God to share that peace with a world that desperately needs to know they're at conflict with you. Not everyone will listen. Some won't and some will attack us and some will hate us and, and that's just the way it is in this world. But we're going to love them to the cross as best as possible. We're going to take the ministry of the reconciliation and the word of reconciliation that God is reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting their trespasses against them. What a message to give a world that's broken like it is. Bless these people. Bless the rest of their day, their week. And may we represent you in a way that you're pleased with as we go about our week. We pray this in the name that is above all names, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks.